is once again at the center of our cosmic model, <laughs> right? It's like, the, it's like the punchline to the ultimate cosmic joke. But, you know, but to understand this, it's not just so simple as, you know, going, ha ha, Copernicus, that, that we have to comprehend this, this strange state of affairs by transcending these dualistic views of reality. It's the only way to really understand what this model's doing. Because the, 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 the complexity of this requires examining it from multiple perspectives. So from the subjective perspective, we are at what astronomers call the observational center, right? As we look out, what we see is dependent on where, when, and how we are. Because light has a speed limit, the further we peer out into space, the further back into time we see. When we measure the stars and galaxies, we're viewing them from humanity's unique perspective in the cosmos. This is the essence of the special theory of relativity, actually. Space and time aren't absolute, they're relative to the observer. Additionally, our view is occluded by the gas and dust in our own galaxy, creating huge blind spots in our model. In other words, all perspectives on the, use, on the universe are thoroughly situated. Obtaining a purely objective God's eye view is actually impossible. This is what we can consider our relativistic sense of time and space. You see these big blank areas, those are just places that we can't measure right now with our current instruments. But relativity doesn't at all mean that our empirical measurements are useless. I know we like to down on objectivity, but it's a really useful notion. Um, by imagining ourselves as objective observers, we've been able to measure and map the world with ever greater precision, developing what we think of as our ordinary scientific sense of time in the physical world. We've continued to extend our sensory range, pushing our abilities to comprehend and simulate phenomena far beyond just our individual experiences. This has provided really extraordinarily useful insights, enabling us to perceive the world in entirely new ways. For instance, we can now visualize numerous processes that intuitively reveal the dynamics of our planetary system that were previously invisible to us. In this case, uh, air currents and ocean currents around the planet. And perhaps not surprisingly, a number of the models that we were taught in school fail to truly demonstrate the dynamic nature of the cosmos. This is actually the public premiere um, of a project called Infinitas, a four-dimensional interactive visualization platform kind of a virtual time machine that extends our ability to see and per perceive ourselves in time. It's, it's created by my colleague Kevin Kelly, who couldn't be here, but he wrote a beautiful book called The Home Planet many years ago. Um, and he's, he's looking and taking into account the fact that the sun is traveling around the Milky Way. We're taught this kind of simple elliptical model where the sun is static, right? Well, when you start moving that, we're going around the sun at 60,000 miles per hour relative to the sun. The sun's moving around the galaxy at about half a million miles an hour relative to the galactic core. And so we are actually spiraling around in these beautiful helical patterns. So when you woke up this morning and you came down here and you're going to go to bed tonight, you're actually millions and millions of miles somewhere else. Right? Everything is constant motion, dynamics, at every single scale. And Kevin's working on ways of turning all of this into new ways of seeing time, new ways of relating to the ways in which we're kind of objectively you know, attempting to measure our place in the cosmos. As we simulate these vast scales of space and time, the entire universe appears as a constant flow of energy and movement. From the subatomic to the galactic scale, everything is in perpetual motion and change. This is simulations of tens of millions of years of galaxies colliding into one another. And perhaps most astonishingly, all of this is integral to each one of us. I mean, this is what modern science has revealed, right? Our bodies are composed of elements that were formed over the course of billions of years on the inside of the hearts of stars. As we experience existence, there is no real separation between our bodies and our minds or humanity and nature. In a very real sense, each one of us is a part of the process of the universe becoming aware of itself. And this is only possible because from a systemic perspective, everything is interconnected and interdependent. We now know that Earth is not only the observational center, but it's also the ecological center of our universe. It's the most complex and self-organizing system that we've ever been able to detect. And science continues to demonstrate how extraordinarily fortunate we actually are to be here. We're finding that life on this planet is supported by these countless synergistic interactions and conditions that we can't understand it just by reducing it. The whole really is more than the sum of the parts. So for instance, the Earth's magnetic field deflects solar winds that are constantly bombarding our planet from the sun. This would look like a torus, like magnets around, you know, iron filings around a magnet, but it's being pushed back and protecting our atmosphere from being blown away into space. 
And we're also in the Goldilocks zone of our solar system, where the temperature is just right for liquid water, not too hot, not too cold. And in conjunction with the atmosphere, this makes the planet's surface ideal for supporting life as we know it. We thought we would be finding life all over the place by now. We haven't found any. And because from a cultural perspective, we are all actually imagining this together. We are creating this universe as we go along. We're kind of in this process of what you might call cosmopoesis, where we're universe creating beings. Because for countless generations, we've turned to the dome of the sky to find meaning in our existence and to synchronize with these cycles of life. By exploring the many cultural attempts to make sense of the cosmos, we can come to appreciate the value of multiple ways of knowing and how different perspectives are constantly shaping our world. Studying these historical perspectives can also encourage us to reflect on how models of the cosmos have shaped perceptions of reality. They kind of act like operating systems for our paradigms, right? And I, I'm glad that the Occupy folks are <laughs> starting to really talk about it as an operating system. They set the frames of reference for how we interpret our experiences of reality. Because even though the standard model is really a linear progression that began with the Big Bang and is slowly dissipating via entropy, there are all of these other conditions that are operating that science has not been able to really account for because of its failure to really look at synergistic processes. Recently, physicist Roger Penrose claims to have detected imprints within the cosmic microwave backgrounds that, are, that he says are remnants of the last cosmic cycle before the Big Bang. And, and in this way, we've kind of literally come full circle. He's seeing it as this regenerative process. And he calls these kind of universe cycles, interestingly enough, aeons after Kronos. But believe me, you know, even this $10 billion model of the cosmos is built on assumptions that will change over time. In many ways, the more we try to quantify the universe, the more mysterious it becomes. In recent years, astronomers appear to have detected a growing number of unseen dark forces that are simultaneously pulling things together and pushing them apart. Dark energy, dark matter, dark flow, they have all kinds of names of it, but they're basically coming up with things to justify their equation. So either our understanding of gravity is completely wrong, or there's some entirely other realm of reality that we have to make up and be very comfortable with the fact that we can't actually see over between 95 and 99 percent of what's out there. You know, so like so much for a rational clockwork universe. So like Magritte points out in his famous painting, The Treachery of Images, we have to be very, very careful with our representations. He reminds us that this is not a pipe. It's, of course, a painting of a pipe. In the same way, we need to realize that even this is not the universe. It's a little u universe, our current limited perspective of the big u universe, the view of which is going to continue to expand and evolve as we grapple with its mysteries. Which suggests to me that perhaps it's time to accept the universe as inherently paradoxical. Instead of attempting to interpret our experiences through this outdated black and white view of reality, we should appreciate the complex, technicolor, multidimensional, and truly mysterious nuances of the big picture. We know that the universe is much more than a linear machine dictated by physical laws. And the experiences of awe, humility, and wonder, and of course, non-dual, can often teach us more about existence and the nature of the cosmos than abstract mathematical equations and periodic tables. By viewing the world and time from multiple perspectives, we can be better prepared to navigate the complex challenges currently facing humanity, which leads us to a very simple mandate. <laughs> we need to reoccupy the universe. The universe matters because we are the universe mattering. It's not something out there, only accessible via you know, telescopes and particle colliders. Earth is once again at the center of our universe because it's the only place that supported our existence. Yet for far too long, we've taken our home planet and life itself for granted. We've been hypnotized by this, this myth of a perpetual growth economy, but we're learning to appreciate that true wealth derives from healthy communities and ecosystems. We need to reimagine a big picture in which Earth's ability to sustain life is the ultimate source of all value. Because whatever perspective you choose to take on time, I encourage you to pay closer attention to the regenerative ecological cycles that support the successful structures, patterns, and habits of the cosmos. And if you want to see what it looks like when people do this, I just want to close by giving you an invitation to visit uh, the Idea Index, which is a series of projects submitted to the Buckminster Fuller Challenge over the course of the past five years. And we put out a call to the world um, to submit projects that are designed to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or to the disadvantage of anyone. Right? If we really want to accept non-duality in all of its gloriousness, we have to recognize it's everybody or it's nobody. 
that we are such an integral part of this planet that our greatest evolutionary task is to learn from these successful regenerative cycles and apply them in the way that we are designing human society so that we can cultivate the conditions for life on this planet. Because, you know, what better way to kind of celebrate this truly non-dual interconnected nature of the universe by applying ourselves to become participants in the creation of a truly resilient and compassionate world. Thanks.